Sorry, Thumbs up. OK. All right. Thank you for joining us on our workshop today. We have with us Sam Light from CERSA, our insurance provider. Um, before we begin, town manager would like to make an announcement. Yeah, I was just going to introduce Sam Light. Oh, so, uh, but you did a great job of that, Mayor. Uh, Sam and I spent last week in uh, Glenwood Springs at the City County, County Managers Association, and uh, we uh, talked about what he's going to present today, and hopefully y'all uh, understand most of this and get a great uh, experience out of this. Sam's done this, what, three or four times for us over the last couple of years. Um, he's been with CERSA for about four years and comes highly recommended by a lot of towns. So. Please put your listening uh, ears on, and I'll introduce Mr. Sam Light with CERSA. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Great, great to see all of you. Thanks for having me down uh, this wonderful, wonderful spring day. Um, as Mike mentioned, I have been down a couple of times over the last couple of years. We have um, some new uh, folks on Council. If I have that correct. Um, we, we've also got it. Four, five. Congratulations, congratulations. Um, and I also have the privilege now of calling you council members. Like the last time I visited you were board members, so congratulations on not only your election, but the adoption of the Home Rule Charter uh, as well. So um, we're all good, audio and video? Um, Mike mentioned I'm general counsel for Ursa. I do, muted. Now I've got it muted. Yeah. All right. Uh, and CERSA stands for the Colorado Intergovernmental Risk Sharing Agency, which is a mouthful, so we just call it uh, CERSA. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background on our organization, not to belabor it, we're not a commercial insurance company. We're a public entity insurance pool. And we were organized under Colorado law. Our only book of business, our only membership is Colorado cities and towns. That's, that's our whole book of business. That's what we... We do. We're very, very proud of that because we think that gives us close relationship with our members and our insureds and also helps build longstanding relationships with the entities that we insure. To give you an example of that, uh, the town has been a member uh, participant in our workers' compensation program since 1993 and a member of our property and liability program since 1994. So thank you very much for your longstanding membership in CERSA, and we hope that um, getting the services you need, need from us. We're always open to suggestions, ways that we can do better and improve. So if there's anything, uh, suggestions you have for us, we're, we're all here. Um, tonight, we're here to talk about, um, you know, for those of you that have been on the council, it'll be a bit of a refresher or a tune up, um, but I hope it's helpful to both the uh, incumbent members and new members. Talk about risk management from an elected official's perspective. I put um, handouts at your places that I'll touch on uh, briefly as I go through um, the material. Um, but what I'm going to do is, is just hit on some high level issues, maybe hit on some uh, current hot topics and some risk management issues that we're um, dealing with and and then take any questions that, that you have. Um, the way I've organized, I got to remember to click my clicker, my uh, presentation slides is we call them suggestions for best practices around risk management issues that we hope will help enhance your effectiveness, you know, individually as a council member, but also as a, as a council. We're going to touch on the role of elected official, organizational structure and liability, transparency. Um, for the new members, who is in public office for the first time? Elected public office. <laughs> okay. They had some service on a board or commission previously. Yeah, so we know this, uh, being in the public sector is you know, much different than being in the private sector, right? Uh, and who's agrees with this sentiment? Being um, on elected public body sometimes is a little bit of a fishbowl. All eyes are on us, right? Uh, so we'll talk about some risk management uh, concepts around that issue as well. Now that you have a home rule charter, I, I think you probably have as a, a coming attraction if you're not working on it already, is a, uh, you're gonna have a local code of ethics, as I understand it. Your charter says that you'll have a local code of ethics, but I'll touch on just a couple of things. And then I'll talk about uh, due process. So those of you who've seen my uh, training before, you know, I have to make this disclaimer, though I am general counsel for CERSA and I'm an attorney. This is not an attorney client uh, discussion. I'm happy to give you 
uh, feedback and suggestions on any topic from SOSA's risk management perspective. But if what you really need is legal advice from your town attorney for some pending issue that you have going on right here and now, uh, you'll want to rely on them for support. And I have a pretty good radar for that. Okay, sometimes somebody says, yeah, I've got a question, Sam. What if another member of the uh, the board does this? And everyone's eyes open wide. And they say, oh, I may give you a suggestion or two, but that's for Bob and his team. Same thing with respect to administrative matters as well. Okay, I'm happy to give you some feedback from Cersei's uh, perspective. But again, if it's something that's in your town manager's wheelhouse, then you'll want to look to him and his, his team for support. Okay, any questions about Cersei, about background? Okay. I'll, I'll I'll tell you a little bit more. The answer to that question of am I covered? I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. All right, so let's dive into my suggestions for risk management at um, the governing body level. So this this may not sound like a risk management principle, but it is one, and it's good to reflect upon this uh, every once in a while. That when you become a public official, your role and relationship to the community changes dramatically. Right, you're no longer just a citizen of Monument. You're now a government official or elected public official, and I'm kind of here to tell you that's a 24-7 job. Does it feel like that sometimes? That doesn't mean, <laughs> right? It's 24-7 for sure. 24-7. <laughs> that doesn't mean give up your personal life. Please have a personal life. Please enjoy it. And recognize in the eyes of your citizens, in the eyes of your constituents, you know, they will always perceive you to be an elected representative of this organization, right? And a representative of the institution of the town council. That's particularly true for the folks who follow local government. And it's particularly true when people are interacting with you on matters of town business, but you will always be perceived to be right a public official. Do you bump into citizens and sometimes they ask you for your opinion on this or that? Not yet, It'll, it's coming, right? And you may say, well, you know, the council hasn't looked at this issue yet. Yeah, 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 but, but what's your opinion? So you're saying to them, well, this is my personal opinion. This is my personal opinion. This is my, and what are they filtering? Council member, council member, council member, right? You will always be perceived to be a representative of the institution of the town council, right? And a representative of the town as an entity. So keep, keep that in mind because as they should, right? Our words, our deeds, our conduct matters, has an effect, leaves an impression. From a citizen's perspective, if that interaction didn't go down the way they thought it might, might for them leave a residue, right? Sometimes that's inevitable, right? But to, to know that that perception uh, can be created is important. And of course, in the worst case scenario, it can even potentially lead to a claim situation. All right, recognize now that you're a government official, you're no longer an outsider looking in, you're on the inside, right? I think there's an old movie called The Star Chamber. You're now in the Star Chamber, right? And it has meaning from this risk management perspective. Once you're on the inside, the town's rules, the, the ordinances that the council and the predecessor boards have adopted, the rules of conduct, policies, they stick to us now, right? It doesn't mean we can't change those policies, but we have to do it through the proper legislative process or policymaking process within the authority uh, that we have. But while the rules are in place, we need to commit uh, to follow those. Recognize also that before you were elected or appointed, you may have had a view of government uh, as a critic or a proponent of a handful of issues or maybe one issue. Um, but now that you're elected, right, it's a different role in terms of being a representative. I guess council member is kind of an ambassadorial role, an ambassador of the organization, champion of the organization. Legally, we call it a fiduciary, and we all know what that means. He's a fiduciary. The interest of the entity we're representing is the paramount. So, uh, so define government. I'm sorry? Define government define at the government. local level. So you just said that you know that uh, we're we're if we were proponents or, or oh. of of um, government, right, right. But you're speaking of the elected office that we're at now, currently. Now that you're on the inside, right? From the outside, you don't have the tethers of being uh, on the board of directors of the corporation, right? Right. But it doesn't apply to like state or federal government. Uh, well, that's kind of above my big pay grade to tell them how to. <laughs> well, but I mean, it, but, but I mean, yeah. I, I'm just saying we're we're in we're in, in unison under the umbrella of of, local of government. monument government. Yes, yes, yes. Beyond that, 
is you know, everybody can have their own opinion on. Right. Okay. Right. That's yeah. just what I wanted to yeah. make. I was, uh, and you helped me turn, look around the corner to another comment I was going to make, and that is as fiduciaries, right? Um, of course, we have a seven member council. We all bring our unique individual perspectives, policy perspectives, right? Those kinds of views. And naturally, right, we're each going to contribute our own voice to that activity. But at the end of the day, as fiduciaries, you're working toward which voice? The one voice of counsel. To your point, that doesn't have to be a 7-0 vote. In fact, you're going to have healthy debates and deliberations on an issue. But whether it's a 5-2, 7-0, or 4-3 vote, at the end of the day, what your constituents are looking to is what was the voice of counsel? What was counsel's decision? Right. Um, so that that's sort of the fiduciary aspect of putting the interest of the organization first. I, I sort of uh, submit the proposition that there's another institution as well to which elected officials have a fiduciary obligation. That's to the council itself as an institution. And right? because at the end of the day, we kind of have to admit that local government and elected bodies, it's kind of like a train. It just keeps on going. And we're all on that train for a certain period of time. <laughs> we either get on and we get off, our terms are up, but that train keeps going. So I would submit to you the one of the ways to look at your tenure is to do the things that make that, help that train get to its destination, make the institution of council stronger for the long term for our successors. Uh, and that, that'll that help. Um, okay, so remember that in the eyes of the community, you're always uh, a public official, I've touched on this already, but as elected officials, you're now guardian stewards, fiduciaries of the town. The town is a corporation, right? But instead of calling a board of directors, they call them a town council, right? Um, and we're probably the most visible type of corporate entities, right? We're all corporations. Um, I think at that fiduciary level, one of the primary uh, ways of looking at the job is that the responsibility of the governing body and everyone within the organization is to protect the town's interest and assets. That's perhaps one of the most critical functions at the governing body level as fiduciaries. That's the term used under law. What is in the town's best interest? Right? What protects the town? That's not always easy, right? But a guiding principle in decision making, particularly around policy decision making or decisions regarding the assets of the entity. Ask yourself, what is the right thing to do for the town, as a town, hopefully for the long term? That may not be easy, right? Some nights you might have a packed room and during public comment, right? First person stands up during public comment and says, council, do this. Next person stands up and says, council, don't do that. Do exactly the opposite, right? In those situations from where you said, I do think one of the powers and prerogatives that you have is again, looking at it in terms of fiduciaries and the long view of the interest of the organization. If you ever feel like you're being rushed or you need more information, right? exercise that prerogative that you have, take the time that you need and get the information that you need. Right? In our world, in, in terms of handling claims, uh, once in a while, not all the claims, but once in a while, claims arise from a decision taken in haste. Right? And so he's mutually supportive of each other. And if we say, Hey, we know we maybe we need to have more deliberation around this issue, or maybe we need some more information from staff. Yes, to your constituents, it might be frustrating and say, well, they, oh, they're not going to make a decision today. But in looking at the best interest of the organization, if you feel like you need that time or more information, that's your right to ask for that. And so use that to your to your advantage. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, risk around the um, process and governance. As local government officials, probably one of your um, Job duties is true for everyone in the organization, but I think for elected and appointed officials in particular is to deliver good good governance. Oh, before before I get to that, let me ask the, the new folks in particular. Do you like process? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you like process? Yeah. At, at the local government level, process is a product in and of itself, irrespective of outcome. Right. Uh, so from a risk management perspective, I uh, encourage you to commit yourself to, to good process, whatever the outcome, even if it's the outcome you wouldn't have preferred, right? Faith and trust in government uh, is uh, enhanced, and I think the risk of claims is decreased when people appreciate the good processes that you provide. At the end of the day, right, it's what do we provide? What's that we provide you as a council, provide a forum and a location for people to come to speak to you about the needs and wants of the community? And then you're uniquely situated within this organizational structure at the top 
of the organizational chart to help decide how we put governmental resources on those needs and wants. But that's a process, right? So enjoy that. Um, one of the other job duties is probably delivering good governance. And I found in doing trainings and observing claims over the years that I think it's both practically and legally from a risk management perspective, just built on a few core concepts. If you commit to those core civics concepts, then I think by and large related legal issues will take care of themselves. So commit yourself to openness and transparency. And if you'll have few, if any disputes around compliance with the open meetings law, open records law, you all know this, but particularly for the new folks, we all sort of know that commitment to transparency to give you but one example. Uh, we use email to do our job as elected officials. Yeah. So we know that state law essentially says that the correspondence of elected officials is a matter of public record. Right. With some exceptions that the town attorney will advise on. So that's an important piece of understanding the expectations around those issues. Commit yourself to fundamental fairness and you'll have few if any people saying, hey, my due process rights were violated. Um, that predominantly at your level comes up for land use and licensing matters. But from where you sit, the best tool you have is if anyone uh, raises a, a, a procedural objection, a fairness objection to a process, you look to your staff, right? If it's planning staff and you're looking at a planning application, maybe someone stands up and says, there's something improper about notice for this hearing. You just take a time out and it's kind of our responsibility to take a time out. And do we have proper notice? Are we queued up properly? That kind of thing. Once in a while, you know, someone may stand up during public comment and say, I object to this uh, public hearing because I didn't get notice. I always thought that was a little strange because they're standing right there, right? So that's, but that's kind of, well, that's the softball, right? But if someone raises a, a you know, a, a fairness procedural concern, it's got, you know, more hair and watch on it. You want to take the time as the governing body say, are we on good ground here? And you've got support and resources to help you with that. Um, commit to being predictable and even handed. I hope that the um, town didn't give you, uh, you know, uh, the day after your election or appointment, that huge code book. Maybe we don't do that anymore, but they're out there. They're out there, those hundreds of pages, uh, right? And that that code book has all manner of regulation and rules around how we make decisions, both procedurally and substantively. And while those are in effect, we want to commit to apply those in a predictable and even-handed manner. The legal risk is if we don't do that and someone feels like they're being treated differently than someone else who's in the same situation. The potential risk is an equal protection claim. The fancy word certiorari claim is essentially an assertion that the, the governmental decision maker uh, went rogue and their decision was based on some arbitrary factors that weren't part of the town's ordinances. Okay. Um, last bullet may not sound like a predictor of risk, but mutual respect uh, may go a long way. On some claims, it's um, you know how it is. Well, maybe the new folks haven't experienced this yet, but you're going to have some of those meetings that are going to be tough. Going to be your meeting rooms going to be packed, right? You got a contentious public hearing. Hopefully, it's not the one after this work session. Um, but you know, <laughs> I don't know. But you know, sometimes <laughs> you know, right, that you're going to make a decision that's not going to make 100 percent of the people happy, no matter what, right? But if they go home from that contentious public hearing and they say to themselves, you know what, I get it now. The council had a really tough job, had to take all these different perspectives on what decision they ought to make. They had to take under consideration the ordinances that apply and all the evidence that was presented. But you know what? That citizen may even say, I, I don't agree with the decision that they made, but I feel like it was a good process. And I feel like I was heard and I feel like it was respected. That'll go a long way to build faith and trust in the council as an institution and in certain situations, reduce your risk profile. Because on some claims, there is that underlying thread of a person goes home and has the opposite thought. They say, well, I, not only do I disagree with what they decided, but I feel like the decision was already made before I got there. I feel like they tuned out when I was speaking. There were some strange things going on at the hearing. I feel like I wasn't respected. Sometimes people get mad enough to say, I'm gonna find someone who can tell me whether or not I can challenge uh, the decision that was made. Okay. All right. Unless there are any questions, thoughts around that concept, let me pivot to suggestion number two, uh, and that's to commit to supporting the town's structure. So an important risk management principle in every organization is to recognize and honor um, the role within the organization. Everyone within the organization, whether you're elected, appointed, full-time staff member, or a volunteer has a job description, right? The risk corollary is this. Um, 
please tell me it wasn't your first question to Bob Cole when he got you know, appointed or elected, but it's, you know, can I get sued in this job as council member? <laughs> yeah, that was your first question. And the answer is, sure, sure. It was a second question. <laughs> Who are you and can I get sued? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, they tie together. Can I get sued and can I be, and here's one, this is the point I want to address because uh, I want to first start with the good news. We have good protections. But to the, to the question being, can I get sued and be held individually, personally liable uh, as a council member? So in Colorado, we have nice protections for you, right? We have this statute called the Colorado Governmental Immunity Act. And it basically says the town, and by extension, the town's insurance company, SIRSA, will defend you and pay judgments entered against you for acts or omissions as a council member. Good, got protection. There's a catch, there's always a catch, isn't there? So the catch is those protections apply only so long as you're acting within the scope of your employment and not acting in a willful and wanton manner, okay? Two strange phrases there. Scope of employment probably sounds odd to you as an elected official. If you're thinking, what do you mean scope of employment? I'm not like the town manager where I'm a full-time employee, I'm an elected official. Right. The takeaway is simply that's the phrase that used in the statute simply means everyone must understand and appreciate their role within the organization, swim within their lane rather than having a water polo match. Right. Uh, to give you an example, that easy example within our organizational structure, right? within whose job description is it within the town of Monument to um, make the initial decision on the approval or denial of a business license? Sticking my neck out here. I hope somebody's going to help me. Remember the clerk or the finance director, right? Yeah. And so whose job isn't it? Everybody, not only you, but everybody else. Everybody else within whose job description, within whose scope of employment within the town is it the responsibility to issue a, a summons into a municipal court? The peace officers or the code enforcement officers. And whose job ain't everybody else? This concept permeates local government. Those hundreds of pages and state statute delegate and allocate responsibility and authority to everyone in the organization. The top of the org chart, your charter says you are the legislative and governing body of the organization. You legislate and deal with the high level corporate decisions on behalf of the institution as the governing body. You deal with the um, quasi-judicial and corporate matters reserved to the town council, right? But otherwise, either by state law or your ordinances, a lot of these other duties have been assigned to other people, whether it's the clerk, the finance director, the manager, the peace officers, et cetera, right? And to efficiently use your resources, be firing on all cylinders, right? And to also reduce your individual liability risk, right? You need to respect that concept, okay? Um, the other strange phrase is willful and wanton. You're protected as long as you're acting within the scope of your employment and not acting in a willful and wanton manner. Willful and wanton is simply this uh, fancy word for this. It's conduct that's intentionally undertaken, that's designed to injure someone's legal rights and taken with reckless disregard for what their rights are. I got an even simpler way to describe it. I just call it bad stuff. And I mean, we know what it is. We're gonna stay far away from it, right? Um, and knock on wood, we don't get many of those types of claims in Colorado. But on occasion, a claimant will make some assertion of willful and wanton uh, conduct, okay? Um, there's kind of a double whammy con uh, aspect to willful and wanton conduct because your public official's liability coverage follows the same concepts and says your public official's protection under your insurance coverage, right, applies to you in your capacity as an elected official, right, while you're discharging your duties for the town. So it's only intuitive that public officials' liability coverage, for example, would not apply, right? And if state law has the same exception, there's no obligation to for the town to defend or indemnify you against willful and wanton conduct or against criminal acts. Public officials' liability policies typically also exclude um, liability that flows from intentional acts or malicious acts. Okay, so that's just the kind of boundaries on where that protection uh, lies. I asked our claims folks to tell me, you know, what, what's the typical situation where we get a claim of willful and wanton conduct? And it's, and it's, it's usually this, not always, but it's usually this. It's usually an elected or appointed official acting individual, misperceiving that they have some governmental authority that they don't have, right? 
throwing on that purported cloak of governmental authority and doing bad things to people for the wrong reasons. And it really would be bad stuff, you know, um, going after a business competitor, or maybe conscripting a staff member to go after a business competitor to make sure their license gets revoked. That's bad stuff, right? Cloning on, throwing on that cloak of governmental authority to engage in malicious acts or, or criminal misconduct. So those are the outer edges of the protection. I just need to make sure we understand where those lie. Uh, but I don't want to sound like the Grim Reaper. I want to flip it around and end on a positive note about this liability piece. On the other hand, don't let the fear of liability drive decision making. Going back to my hearing example, you know, you may have someone standing here and says, if, if, if you deny this application, I'm going to sue each and every one of you individually. Okay. But if you know that you've made the right decision, following a fair and defensible process, appropriately applying the applicable criteria, then you're going to be just fine, right? And that's what these protections are there for, right? To protect you uh, against those kinds of things, okay? Any questions about that piece? Insurance, I can keep going on insurance if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Um, that was that was the state, just to finish wrapping that up. That was the state. The, the Colorado Governmental Immunity Act essentially provides you a form of qualified immunity at a state level. The same concept, of, there's a similar, not exact, but similar concept at the federal level, right, where you're immune from uh, civil rights liability insofar as your conduct does not violate clearly established statutory or constitutional rights over the reasonable person would have known. Well, that's good. Well, how do I know or should have known? You have support. You have support. You have a team from where you sit, you know, to stay out of the weeds. If, if ever you're feeling uncomfortable or someone's raising concern, you don't have authority to do that. Or maybe your concern is, hey, I'm, uh, are we getting on thin ice here? Right? Your town attorney is there to support you in answering those questions, your team, right? Uh, give them a little bit of grace when it comes back with that lawyerly answer. Because in some situations, really is the answer is it depends, right? Sometimes lawyers are going to do that, right? Uh, but they're there to help work through the issues and help uh, you understand what your options are uh, before making a decision. Okay. All right. Um, here's some tips to support um, organizational structure and avoid any concerns about role discipline. As I mentioned earlier, um, the idea of delegations of authority permeate, permeates your charter and ordinances, right, in your organizational structure. Recognize that they're there to serve and protect you. They serve you because either the citizens in the charter or your your predecessor boards by ordinance have said, we as, a, we as the governing body don't want that job. We want to sign it to the manager or the clerk or someone else in the organization, or maybe state law did that already, right? They protect you in a claim situation when we can say sometimes our claimants attorneys get a little zealous. And maybe, maybe to use my example from earlier, maybe the uh, challenge was the denial of a business license. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, did we think it was the clerk or the finance director? And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, someone's going to bring a legal challenge to the denial of a business license. The appropriate defendant would be the clerk in his or her official capacity and the town as an organization. Sometimes I get an overzealous claimant who will say, well, I'm going to start naming some elected or appointed officials individually. Right? Well, we can extract those individuals pretty readily from that lawsuit, right? If there's no evidence that they had any role in that, right? And that's where recognizing the delegations of authority protects you. As we can say to that claim, well, wait a second, why are you making allegations of individual liability? The, or the, the ordinances say that's the clerk's responsibility, not the elected officials. Once in a while, the claim will say, oh, I get all that. And I know who's responsible under the code for making decisions, but my allegation is that there were elected or appointed officials lurking around behind the scenes, directing that the decision be made. That's the bad situation that can arise, and you'll be fine um, staying far away from those. Those delegations are there to protect you. Now, this is not to understate that I recognize uh, next bullet here, that part of the job of an elected official is being eyes and ears, ambassador, being out in the community, hearing, um, building relationships with one another. In compliance with the open meetings law that we'll talk about in a second, right? But recognize that a governing body acts and can only act, right, if it meets in a public meeting and takes action as a group. And that's a good thing from a risk standpoint, because there are all sorts of protections that apply when you're meeting and acting together as a group in this room. Just to give you an example of the risk principles that come into play, there's legislative privileges, that come into play, potential quasi-judicial immunity. And you can just see that it's hard for someone 
remember my early example about this, but it's like, well, I, I don't like the decision you made, but but I'm going to sue you and only you individually. And you're, you're thinking, wait, it's like, I'm just one of seven here <laughs> that voted on this thing, right? So when you act as a group, number one, you're required to do that. And number two, that's where there's uh, safety in that. So last bit on this is just a little more nuanced. Mayor, do you, um, during the meetings or at the end of meeting, have a, a, an opportunity for council member reports or council member updates? Those are coming. Those are coming. Okay. So, at some point when the meetings aren't going to last too long. Too long. Uh, consider this, maybe or maybe not. It's maybe it's part of a fiduciary commitment to the council as an institution. But be attuned to this dynamic. What if the mayor says, um, okay, does any anyone have any comments? And it's council member reports. You say, oh, yes, mayor. Um, and council, I've got something to report. Since our last meeting, I did this. And everyone else's hair stands on end and eyes open while you, you did what? Right? There may never be a third party liability risk that flows from that. But does it raise the question of, you know, have we as council talked about what our expectations and norms are as a council for how we act on behalf of the council, right? Or represent the council as an entity in between the meetings? I think it's a wise. Council that has that discussion because they want people to be protected and you want to build strength in the council. It's absolutely true that you have, you know, maybe a liaison role or you volunteer. Yes, uh, who would like to go to that meeting? <laughs> and the mayor's asking, oh, I'll go. But do we know what the expectation are? What position are you delivering on behalf of council? Conversely, if you volunteer at the mayor's request, I'll go to that meeting. You know, um, you have the prerogative. If, if sometimes you can get cornered at that meeting and say, well, "What's the town's position?" <laughs> and if we haven't had a chance to talk about it, you have every right to say, "Well, we haven't talked about it as a council." You know, no matter how hard you get pushed, you say, "Well, you know, our council has to adopt its position, so we'll get we'll get back to you." Okay. Let's see. Um, Commitment to the role discipline and to strengthening strengthening the uh, councils and institution does require a couple of personal sacrifices, some of which I've listed here. One would be setting aside a personal agenda when there's lack of support. You know, if they say, well, one of my priorities when I got elected was I want us to have an ordinance that does this, right? But if there aren't three members willing to come along at a minimum, I have to be willing to shelve that personal interest, that personal agenda in favor of service of the work plan and priorities of the council as identified by the council as a whole. Do you have um, split votes every now and then? You mean like four to three? Yeah. Sometimes. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Well, that's good. Well, I'll move up quickly on this one. But what if you have a five two vote? If you're on the two side, right, can you go back to your citizens and the, the folks that you take counsel from individually and go and tell them, <laughs> I didn't vote for that one? I'm just the insurance person. Okay, far be it for me to tell me that you, tell you that you can't say that to your constituents. You can say that to them, right? But it was on the public record anyway. They know how you voted. Right? Would the message be different? Would the message in 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 support of the council institution be stronger if you said, "I didn't vote for that one, but you know what? We had a lot of differing opinions. I fought like heck for my position, but council decided to go in a different direction, and I support." The decision that council reached. At the end of the day, we're all going to win some and lose some in the in the policy making process. So that that approach um, might lessen potential for conflict among the council, but it probably will strengthen the council as an institution. Um, reaching back just a little bit, recognize that in that I don't harp too much on the policy administrative distinction, but recognize in local government very fascinating aspects to the job because there might be. A, um, some aspect where there's a policy making function, right? That that you'll carry out, but then your work is done, right? And then the ball gets passed to staff to implement that policy, right? That's one of the wonderful things you should use to your advantage of having a council manager form of government. You legislate, you make policy, you decide overall priorities, the budget, those kinds of things, then you hand that off to your staff to take care of on your behalf. Recognize once in a while that that's going to lead to them handling a hot potato. Right, uh, but we're mutually supportive. If that's what our policies and rules require, then we're supportive. And hey, that's sometimes we got to make tough uh, decisions. Okay, um, you said it hadn't happened too much, but sometimes a, a, a citizen will come up to you on an individual. They want to ask you something. 
what's the town think of this? And now your radar is going up. You go, hmm, I think they might, you know, they might just run with this, whatever I say to them, right? So protect yourself from that. If it really is a council matter, right? If they're just asking your personal opinion, you know, what do you think of uh, an ordinance that requires um, electric charging stations? Hey, share your personal opinion. That's fine, right? But, but if they're, you know, if they're saying, yeah, I got a piece of property over here and I'm thinking of uh, it'd be better uh, suited for apartments than for, uh, you know, this, what do you think? Right. Wait a second. That's a council decision. Right. And protect yourself uh, from that regard, because there's probably a risk there. It's over my pay grade. If once in a while people will circle back around and they'll think that uh, you may have assured an outcome, which you really you can't do. Only council can deliver uh, the final outcome on a decision that belongs in council's wheelhouse. All right. Um, adherence to organizational structure is particularly important in the area of employee relations. Um, through your recently adopted charter, wonderful place to be. You have the structure and organization that is a council manager form of government where the council, I think within that structure, probably means that as the governing body, you have the longest and broadest vision and work responsibility for the organization. Things like legislative policy, the annual budget, long-term planning, and then your manager is responsible for getting the work done consistent with the priorities and policies that you set. Use your manager as a resource, right, to help you get things done and look good while while doing it. Because sometimes the citizen will, and they they may not be familiar with organizational structure or how the town works, but they'll come to you, and it may not be in your wheelhouse or council's wheelhouse. You can refer that question over to Mike. He follows up with the citizen. He lets you know he followed up. Next time you see that citizen, hey, did we get you the information you need? All thumbs up. Maybe it's this. You know, well, we're always we're always open to ways to that kind. Of our town manager is well abused from that perspective. <laughs> yes, you can use the manager to unburden yourselves from those types of inquiries uh, uh, as well. I do recognize that there is a, some legal language around this concept of the uh, policy and administrative distinction. I've cited it on the slide here. Uh, your charter section 7.4 has got a provision in there about the relationship of town council to the administrative service, which obviously says the members of the town council shall uh, deal with administrative personnel uh, or consultants through the town manager and shall not give orders to any employee. Okay. Um, that probably might you know, correct me if I'm incorrect here, but we can be collegial and say hello to the town employee and you can just ask a general question. But imagine it from their perspective, right? If they have an elected official coming to them, you know, a line employee is going, mm -hmm on here you know this is not so your charter requires right an efficient use of your resources um councils that you use your manager for those types of things and then of course he lives by the rule of bring all the council up to the same level of information as concurrently as possible so if you have a need or an inquiry right he may say well um you know hey great question i'll bet other council members have that question too we'll get some information out for everyone's benefit on that issue but use your manager as a resource to help you and did you say well abused? <laughs> Very well abused. <laughs> there you are. Anything you want to add, Mike? No, sir. All right. Yeah. But it, it works. <laughs> it, it, we do now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's turn the page and talk about transparency. I want to move uh, quickly here. I don't know if the town attorney's uh, gone over this yet. It'll be a refresher for the folks who've been around a bit, for the new folks. Um, as, a, as a governing body, local government body, we're subject to the openness requirement of the Colorado Open Meetings Law. And there's a lot going on in that statute, but two things to drive home. It's got an openness provision that says whenever three or more members of the council meet to discuss public business, that's a meeting that has to be open to the public. It simply means a citizen has a right to observe that discussion. Second, any kind of action or any kind of meeting of a quorum for members of the council has to occur in a duly noticed public meeting, okay? So that's all pretty straightforward stuff, right? Um, a couple of twists on that. A meeting for purposes of the open meetings law includes any kind of meeting convened in person, by phone, we still using phone meetings? Well, or electronically, electronically. When they added that phrase back in the statute in 1996, what they meant was legislature and email. But it applies to all sorts of other things, right? A Zoom meeting, what have you. So recognize that electronic communications also trigger the openness uh, requirement of the statute. All right, I asked the question earlier, you're all using email to do your job as elected officials. 
recognize that the use of email can trigger the openness requirement of the open meetings law, right? So that's why staff is, is suggested don't don't hit reply all on email. If you get the packet on Friday night and you see something interesting to you, you don't want to email the rest of the council or, or you know two more of them and say what do you think of this? And then you, next thing you know you got a debate going on, right? About that issue by email. What's the concern? Not open. Not open. Okay. Um, so um, I'm not a. We're not. It's sort of uh, ludites. I think is the phrase. We're not anti-technology, but just recognize that as local government officials, there are rules that apply to the use of the technology. So for email, my first handout talks more about what those risks are and gives you, I take uh, sole and full responsibility for the suggested do's and don'ts in the use of email. The state legislature, they, they added that phrase in 96. They finally, two years ago, legislature jumped back into the fray and passed a law that helped clarify uh, what types of emails are okay in terms of not triggering the openness requirement. But it's things like an FYI email. You know, so if you're working on ordinance about uh, electric charging stations, you know, you email, hey, I found, hey, fellow council members, FYI, I found this interesting article. That's fine, right? Um, scheduling and availability, even if all seven of you are jumping in into the email thread, it, well, that's only natural because we want to know when people are available, right? So that's okay. FYI, scheduling and availability, posing a question. So you get your packet, posing a question for discussion at a later date, right? And you see, oh, I, we have a development application coming up. I don't see in the packet traffic study. Email. City manager, I didn't see the traffic study. Could you be sure staff is prepared to address questions regarding the traffic impact? That's fine, even if you copy, copy your fellow council members so they know you raised the question. But it's all in view of a discussion occurring where here in this room. Yeah. So that's okay too. And then finally, I don't know if this is true for you, Mayor, but sometimes the mayors get more emails than the rest of you. <laughs> uh, you know, and he may write back to the citizen and copy you all so that he doesn't know whether you got that email or not. No, I abuse the town manager. Yeah, uh, he'll send it. And I tell him to let the council know. Yeah, right. Yep. Part of the abuse policy. Right. Yep. There's an abuse. <laughs> we, we've got an ethics policy and an abuse the manager policy. There you go. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Well, that removes any issue because it just eliminates because administrative staff is not subject to the openness requirement. But you can copy a citizen and you can copy your fellow council members on a response to the citizen without triggering, triggering the openness requirement. Okay. Who uses social media to do their job as a council member? Okay. I don't have all the magic answers. And I think I came down a year or so ago and we, we during one of your retreats and happy to send the slides back uh, to that. But there are a lot of issues around social media. The law is not yet settled. As you know from the headlines, there's some risk around these issues. Um, so in the handbook that I handed out or to your places, there's a chapter on social media to use, just some things to think about there. Um, from where you sit, um, one of the suggestions I make is, um, you were, you know, if you were on social media before you got elected and you got your own personal page, now that you're elected, and those people who knew you personally still know you personally, you have every right if you want to say, do you all have town issued email addresses? Yeah, if you want to keep your personal social media account personal, you have every right to say to that person, hey, you know, don't, uh, I, please don't send me a direct message on Facebook or something like that or Snapchat me. If you'd like to correspond with me regarding town business, please email me at this address. And that maybe helps you manage some of these uh, issues. Okay. Speaking of that, you yeah. need to stop Snapchatting me. <laughs> TikTok. TikTok, Snapchat, <laughs> all those kinds of things. Right. Okay. Um, last piece on transparency is I did put it to your place as an article about um, executive sessions. Okay. Um, and staff's going to help you in the moment, right? Make sure that you queue up executive sessions appropriately, but it's critically important that you get all the procedures correct. It seems like it takes a long time to go in executive session. There's reason for that. You got to make sure that all the T's are crossed and the I's dotted in the call of the executive session. And then when you're in executive session, it's your fiduciary obligation to make sure we kind of self police, stay on top of it, right? So if you call an executive session for a matter subject to negotiation, and that's the only authorized topic while you're in there, you can't say, 
Well, while we're in here, can we also talk about that personnel matter? That that would not be permitted. Okay. It's legally possible to leave the executive session, start over with a new executive session, but you can't mix and match topics uh, when you're in there. And then whatever it looks like to you all, have tools, uh, common understandings about how we protect confidential discussions. And okay, maybe it's the tool of if you're in executive session, maybe it's a matter for discussion of a matter subject to negotiation. Um, who's ever leading the discussion may or may say to the group, OK, so we've gotten a, uh, we got direction to our negotiator. Before we break from executive session of all the confidential information that we've discussed during this executive session, which information, if any, leaves this room and who are our spokespeople? And that's a good way to get on the same page. And then as fiduciaries of the organization, you're duty bound to respect that confidentiality. And I think that's true even if you know, even if you voted against going into executive session, or even if you can't stand the underlying transaction being considered, as a fiduciary, you're still obligated to protect the confidential information belonging to the city and the council. Okay. I'm not going to talk too much about ethics, um, but I'll be looking for your uh, ordinance when that comes down the pike. That'll be an interesting exercise uh, for you all. There is a little bit in your charter about ethics. I just want to get a couple of issues. Um, out there for you. So um, you do take a look at Charter Section 210 that talks a little bit about conflicts of interest. Recognize that it also says council will by ordinance adopt standards of conduct. Um, whatever that looks like, when you get into this exercise, I, I know that codes of ethics get a lot of legalese in them. And it can be kind of squishy, but you want to take the time to get familiar with what those require. And I dare say make them your best friend. He's, wait a second, best friend. These are just traps. Not, make him your best friend in terms of if I have a good working understanding of what the standards of conduct require, then I'm prepared to spot issues before they arise, right? So that I can then take the time I need to think through what's the proper course of conduct. And so I can analyze whether or not I have a conflict of interest that requires refusal. Then I can consult uh, with folks and try to as best I, I can understand exactly what my obligations are in this particular situation. OK, the charter does say that if you have a conflict of interest, you'll need to disclose that to the council, recuse yourself. By the way, a conflict is generally defined under your charter. A conflict of interest occurs when a member of the town council has a substantial personal or financial interest in the outcome of, of a question, whether direct or indirect. There's a lot of squishy things there, but you'll look forward to kind of working through some of those in your ordinance, right? Um, so that's when you have a conflict of interest, you have to disclose that, recuse yourself from the council's discussion and vote. And I think if I remember correctly, it requires that you leave leave the room as well. We're, We're professionals at this already, so. <laughs> All right. I'll Been there, done on. that. Yeah. Uh, moving on. Last bullet is that also recognize, you know, fair, unfair in matters of ethics, perception can equal reality and reality can equal perception. Um, I don't know what it looks like to any one of you individually, but. In analyzing issues, I just commend you to look at that piece as well. Okay. All right, let's talk. Last uh, substantive topic is to talk about due process. Um, the new folks, uh, we got a couple that were appointed in February, right? And it's on elected last fall. So have you all sat through and participated in a quasi judicial hearing yet? Like a land use decision? They will tonight. They will tonight. That would be a fascinating part of the job. Okay. Because sometimes you wear his hat of legislator, and that's when council is just making general policy that applies to no one in particular, just everybody in general. You're working on some new ordinance about animal control or whatever. Actually, you have a legislative matter on tonight's agenda. You have an ordinance to amend your liquor licensing rules. Are you the liquor licensing authority? For the town, we are. Okay, so that that shows the comparison. Tonight, you're just working on legislation to change the general liquor rules. Somewhere down the road, you might actually have a license application in front of you. Where you're not a legislator anymore, you're now sitting as a judge, right, in judgment of someone's particular application. They call that quasi judicial. A quasi judicial decision is one where we as a council uh, are making a decision that affects the protected property rights of a specific individual or applicant. Okay. And in that role, there are different rules that apply that essentially require us to act like judges. That sounds kind of strange and wonky. Where does all this come from? Right? The U.S. and state constitution. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property 
without due process of law. Okay, and so that due process concept applies, right, to licenses, land use applications that are quasi judicial uh, in nature. So what you want to do is become familiar with the quasi judicial rules of engagement. A lot different than the legislative aspect. For example, when you're working on general legislation, let's say the community wants you to council, we don't like the animal control ordinances anymore. We want you to, you know, amend the ordinances to uh, tighten the restrictions on the number of cats and dogs. Heck, you can vote for that because you love or hate cats or dogs. You can lobby people and be lobbied. You can get your information from anywhere you want, right? But when you're making these quasi-judicial decisions, all those concepts have to be set aside. You have to think as a judge where you can only make your decision based on the information that's provided to you at the hearing, where the decision has to be made based on the existing criteria, right? If you have a liquor license, you decide new liquor license applications, right? Yeah, there are criteria that apply, but here's an example of one that doesn't apply. Sometimes at the end of a liquor hearing, someone says, well, good hearing. Thank you all for your testimony. I'm going to vote against this license because I don't drink. Not, in a, not a legally permissible criteria. There are criteria that apply. Things like is the applicant at least five, is the premises at least 500 feet from the school? Is the applicant of good moral character, you know, rather than a six time convicted tax felon, whatever it may be, right? But your staff is there to guide you. That's what your staff report is for. The, the Probably my biggest takeaway for quasi-judicial decision-making is after the hearing's done, the staff has done their piece, the applicant questions have been answered. When you're deliberating right, as a council, that's the time to have those criteria at the ready in front of you. I intend to vote in favor of this application because I think it meets criteria A, B, and C. Or if it's the opposite, I intend to vote against this application because it doesn't meet these criteria, right? And what's naturally going to happen is when you have a discussion with each other about the criteria, you're going to make a defensible record, right, regarding the reasons for which you approved or disapproved the application. Sometimes it gets to a little rocky start. Someone may say, maybe you've got like a development plan. You say, well, um, I'm going to vote against this development plan because I, I just don't like it. It's a little rocky start, but as the decision makers, as the quasi judges, you can get there just by asking each other why. Why don't you like it? Right? And maybe it's a fuzzy criteria. I don't like it because I don't think it's compatible with the neighborhood. Keep going. Why do you think it's not compatible with the neighborhood? Well, because as the applicant said, they're going to do stucco with rooftop landscaping, and actually our <laughs> design standards require that they have pitched roofs rather than flat. And you'll get there. And that'll serve you very well. Okay. In the interest of time, I just want to point out that the last slide is a couple of training resources, some um, slides from my presentation at the Colorado Municipal League Conference uh, last year on quasi judicial decision making together with uh, a webinar. And my last handout talks about the quasi judicial making process and the quasi judicial rules of engagement. So, with that, wrap things up with just a couple of concluding thoughts. There's a lot of things. Um, that maybe you feel like you can't always control. And there's some things that will be foisted upon you and your service as a public official, right? Um, certain aspects of risk control, we certainly can't, right, uh, control all of them. You know, what, what, what claimants might do, public perceptions, what the legislator might do. Um, but in terms of risk management, I think it's a wise um, governing body that tries to control the things that it can control. Um, just to give you an example, some areas around risk that we see uh, in this regard, right? Um, do the right things in the areas that you can control to support success and reduce risk. Okay, you know, maybe commit to a no surprises approach with each other. Your meetings ought not to have a sense of a gotcha moment, right? Or uh, staff bashing. You know, personnel matters involve privacy interests. Even if a citizen comes up during public comment and he's just bashing a town employee, okay? Um, Imagine how powerful it is if we remind them this is not the place for personal attacks. Even if you have a concern, well, of course, if you have a concern, you're going to express that uh, question to the town manager. Just trust if he says, I got it, we have to respect that he's responsible for all personnel issues downstream of the manager, right? Um, so imagine how powerful it is to do that. Um, touting your successes, right? May not sound like a risk management thing, but so much around local government sometimes is the negative. 
Right, but I think it is important to tout the good things you're you're doing and the successes that you're having, both as a council and as an organization, as your staff, to build faith and trust in in what you're doing. Recognize that you're perceived as holding the most powerful positions in local government. I think it's a wise council that commits to dealing effectively with discord. Right, um, with a seven member group, there's going to be disagreements, and we can have disagreements without being disagreeable. Certainly, don't let discord drive your decision making or how you interact. With each other, it might be a difficult conversation. You might ultimately have to agree to disagree, but it's a wise counsel that you know, it's coming from one member or a group of members. You say, to, "What's really bothering us? Is there something that we, as a council, ought to change the way we interact, rules of conduct, guidelines, or something to get those uh, out on the out on the table?" So, with that, um, always commit yourself to service of the council as an institution, the city as an entity. Uh, I'm thinking in terms of your fiduciary role, and that will serve serve you well. So with that, Mayor and Council, I'll stop. Open it up for any questions that you have. Um, I think I mentioned all the handouts. That'll open up to any questions you have. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Light? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> they may come later. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, to visit. For everybody else, I think we're going to take, we're going to go five minutes late. Right. Start at 